Hi, and welcome to the ninth lecture in the uh, E375 series. We're going to kind of turn the corner uh, from the last few lectures that have focused on data visualization, as well as a few uh, introductory simple summary statistics, uh, to thinking about uh, diving into data analysis. So the, the last lectures on visualization and summary statistics uh, uh, are together, those approaches are kind of central to what we would call exploratory data analysis, uh, where the goal is to uh, see what the data is kind of is telling us uh, before we en embark on more formal statistical analyses. Uh, in this lecture, we shift towards those more formal statistic statistical analyses by introducing the idea of statistical models. So what is a statistical model? And why would you need one? Um, ultimately, ultimately, we rely on models anytime we need to test hypotheses or make predictions. Uh, I'll also emphasize throughout the course that the human mind is remarkably good at pattern recognition, especially when using our visual system. Uh, we will find pattern in data and in the world around us even when there isn't pattern. Uh, so some, while some would argue that statistics helps you find patterns in data, I'll say that they're equally about telling us when the patterns we think we see aren't real. So, you know, uh, larger question than what is a, a, a statistical model is just what is a model to begin with? Um, so I would argue uh, that a model is a simplified representation of reality. Uh, and that's actually an important definition because it, it makes clear that that no model is perfect, nor is any model meant to be perfect. They're meant to be simplifications by definition. Uh, most of the models we work with in this class are going to specifically be uh, uh, mathematical or, or computational models, uh, but we can have other sorts of models of things, such as physical models, such as this picture of a, a Lego model of the International Space Station, which is actually one that uh, you know, is, is often in the background of my Zoom meetings because I, I bought one to get a better feel uh, for the layout of the space station in particular to find uh, the location and arrangement of some of the sensors uh, that my own lab was using that are actually located on the, on the ISS. Um, and so it's not meant to provide the full detail of the full physical object because you're trying to improve our understanding by kind of reducing the complexity of the real world or, or have a means of making predictions about something. So why model? Like I just said, uh, the, the reasons for modeling fall into kind of two broad categories. Uh, first is fundamentally to try to improve our understanding, uh, to help us generate hypotheses, to help us test hypotheses, synthesize knowledge, uh, assess uh, our data and any gaps in the data, reduce the dimensionality of our data, simplify things to really get a, a better uh, conceptual understanding of what's actually going on in the world. Uh, models also can sometimes just use to focus discussion. You know, like we can write down a model just to, to help us talk about the world around us uh, in, in, you know, uh, in, a, in a shared manner. Uh, models are also really useful for making predictions. This can be you know, interpolations between observations, extrapolations beyond those observations, uh, running scenarios, you know, what if this happened or what if that happened. Uh, informing management and decision making, and, and sometimes even, you know, optimizing the the uh, the control of actual systems. Uh, so you can have models that are, you know, optimizing how uh, uh, systems are run. So like, you know, the uh, the system controlling like the flu of a dam might be, you know, in part computer controlled that has an underlying model of the system. So. I don't want folks to think that models by necessity have to be complicated things. Uh, and I would argue uh, that the simplest model that we are you know, routinely going to deal with is, is actually quite simple. So the simplest model might say some observed variable y is at some constant value a. And so that, that simple model there is, is still a model. It says, you know, I think the world is unchanging, or I think this particular part of the world is unchanging over the, uh, you know, the spatial and temporal scale that I'm interested in. 
Uh, and we still might need to know about, uh, you know, what A is and uh, to make predictions and understand the system, even if it's a very, very simple model. That said, you know, models can be much more complicated than just a constant. But let's start with, with remembering that, that even just a constant value is still a model. And furthermore, uh, if we go from a simple model to a simple statistical model, um, you know, we're, we're going to employ some techniques that, that are going to be the same even when models get more complicated. Um, so here, we're, when we think about this as our, our simple statistical model, our response variable y now needs to be a random variable, as we defined in the last lecture on probability. You know, a variable can take on multiple values. And it, we're going to represent y as a random variable to account for the uncertainties that we have about y. You know, we may think the world is constant, but there may be variability in the data that we see about uh, that process. And some of that might be that the world really is constant. And uh, what we're seeing is just noise in our observations, or it might be the world really isn't constant and we're using the uncertainty to, to represent the fact that our model is inadequate. And so in practice, how we do this is by adding on this error term epsilon that tells us about how any particular observation differs from that model A. So if, if Y and A are a little bit different, you know, epsilon accounts for that difference. Furthermore, uh, we're going to write down a probability distribution describing epsilon, those errors around that constant A. And here, we're going to use this syntax throughout the semester where we're saying epsilon and then this tilde. This tilde is uh, read as, is distributed as. Uh, and this N around these parentheses is the common short notation that we use to represent a normal distribution, a Gaussian distribution. Normal and Gaussian are the same thing. Um, and the normal distribution has two parameters, a mean and a variance, or a mean and a standard deviation, depending on the parameterization. And so this was, would say uh, these differences between y, our random variable, describing reality in A, this constant unchanging mean, uh, is distributed normally with mean zero and error sigma. And that mean zero is assuming that, you know, that our, that our model isn't biased, you know, that, that, you know, that A is, you know, A may not be a perfect description of the world, but, you know, the errors above and the errors below uh, are kind of canceling out, so it's, uh, on, on average, it's getting things right. Okay, we can simplify this model, which we've written in two lines, one that uh, kind of emphasizes what we would call uh, the process model, y equals a, and this other one, epsilon, that emphasizes what we'll later call the data model, the differences between y and a follow some probability distribution. We combine those, uh, we can simplify that into one overall equation, in this case saying uh, y, our observations, our data, are distributed normally with mean a and an error uh, sigma squared. And this gives us a, a simple statistical model for describing our data y in terms of a mean and a standard deviation, or mean and a variance. Uh, but it's important to note that by viewing this as a model rather than just summary statistics, so we already learned that you can calculate the mean as a summary statistic and the standard deviation as a sum summary statistic. Uh, but by viewing this as a model for the process y, uh, we can now think about how we can use this model uh, to test hypotheses, such as is A bigger than zero or not, uh, or to make predictions uh, into the future. So this is a, a graphical representation of what our model actually is. It says that there's some you know, mean value A with some variability around it, uh, explained by, by sigma. Um, cool. 
Uh, from here, we can move on to fitting more complex models, such as this one, this curve here, known as the michaelis menten uh, model, and the equation for it is in the, the bottom. Uh, and I think this figure illustrates um, something important, which is that what distinguishes any model from whether it's a, being a mechanistic model or not isn't the equation for the model, but the context. Uh, so for example, if the y-axis here uh, is the rate of some biological re reaction, such as you know, photosynthetic rate, and the x-axis here is the concentration of some input into that reaction, such as the concentration of CO2, uh, then this is a mechanistic biochemical model for photosynthesis. On the other hand, if this functional form you know, is also a convenient description of lots of other environmental processes that initially increase, uh, but then to level off to some asymptote. Um, and importantly, the statistical model that we would build around this process model uh, is identical regardless of context. So regardless of whether the michaelis menten model is being used because it represents a true uh, mechanistic model for a process or whether it's being used just as a convenient statistical description, uh, from a statistical modeling perspective, there's not really a distinction. You know, we'd, we'd write down this model, we'd add some additional error that describes the fact that these circles, the data, don't all line up perfectly on that curve. There's something else uh, going on in the real world that's uh, not accounted for by the model. If the model was perfect, you know, it would capture all the wiggles in the data. Uh, there wouldn't be any error. So that, again, that could be observation error, that could be, you know, some other process we're not accounting for. Um, but in both cases, whether this is a mechanistic model or just a, a statistical description, we are using probability to capture our imperfect knowledge about the world. <clears throat> so in the next series of videos, we're going to dive into a, a specific class of statistical models known as linear models that are really the workhorse of a lot of data analysis that occurs. Uh, so thanks, and I'll pick up from there.